Good afternoon here in the UK. Must be noon in the USA. Late evening in Asia, midnight in some parts of the world. Wherever you are, on behalf of TVC in TV, this is Dr. Mary Angela Moore, Director of TVC in TV, welcoming you once again to our favorite show, Tech Talk, where we showcase our favorite planet shaker and world changer in the field of electric car industry. Our featured monthly guest, the young but wise founder and CEO of Natrion, Alex Kosyakov. Let's also welcome the permanent host for Tech Talk, a material scientist of a, and an author of a book called A Theory of Everything, Things I Wish I Had Known When I Was a Child. He is prolific with a vast experience in lithium iron battery industry. Let's all welcome back Dr. Jonathan Robin Top. We've got a new face today joining us in this afternoon's promising podcast is an equally promising young man named Vish Kananan. Vish had been working in the field of lithium iron batteries and electrochemical energy systems for about eight years. He was co-technical lead for Amte Power's Ultra High Power Cell, a lithium iron power cell that can charge in six minutes and deliver a range of 180 miles. At present, he's working as a senior cell technology engineer at Williams Advanced Engineering. So that's my role just to introduce the three gentlemen. Today, I'm sure that uh, this is going to be another interesting show with the three of them, three experts, and uh, three prolific people in the show. I leave you guys, and I hand over the microphone or the stage now or the <laughs> to our mainstay guest, Alex Pasiako. Yes, uh, thanks for the kind intro, uh, Angela, John, great, great to see you again, and uh, very nice to meet you, Vish. Um, uh, th thanks for taking the time today, and uh, yeah, great, great to be back on Tech Talk. Thanks for putting this together, John and, and Angela. Yeah, Yeah. thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks, Alex, and th thanks very much to Angela for the very warming introductions. I'm I'm John Tuck and I'm a holistic energy scientist representing Silent Koala. I've got over 20 years of experience in the energy storage and energy generation industry across the range of technologies from commercially available product to blue sky innovation. I work predominantly in intellectual property for a battery manufacturing company in the UK, and I'm a consultant and advisor to startup technology companies. Now, I've known Vish since around uh, 2018 when I was working with his startup company in Singapore, Surge Analytics. And I soon learned what an incredibly intelligent, knowledgeable and driven man he is. So it gives me tremendous pleasure to hand the floor over to Vish to introduce himself before Alex and I ask him more about his work, pursuits and interests. Over to you, Vish. Uh, thank you so much, John, uh, and thank you so much, Angela, as well, for the kind introductions. Um, yeah, it's been uh, good uh, to be here, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the to the questions and to to a great discussion. Yeah. So, Vish, Vish, just tell us a bit more about yourself. I mean, and and if you want, start at the beginning. I mean, we ran into <laughs> each other in Surge Analytics. Tell us a bit about how that came together and, and where you were at with it and what you're up to then and how that's led to where you are now. I mean, Williams Advanced Engineering, <laughs> that's that's an amazing, amazing place to be. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, so I was doing uh, my PhD program in Singapore and it was um, a joint PhD program between the National University of Singapore and uh, with the collaboration uh, with uh, the University of Cambridge. So I was working in the Cambridge Center for Advanced Research and Education in Singapore. Um, 
And my thesis was basically focused on coupling uh, the complex mechanisms of uh, different electrochemical energy systems like uh, lithium batteries, electrochemical capacitor, um, a PEM fuel cell, and a CO2 electrolyzer. Uh, it's, it's about coupling the complex working mechanisms of these electrochemical energy systems with machine learning and AI to obtain insights into these systems that were not previously available. So the overall vision of my thesis was to enable a net carbon uh, neutral or even a net carbon negative energy cycle. So uh, you would have, um, you know, uh, on-demand uh, power production from uh, the PEM fuel cell, on-demand energy conversion from their CO2 electrolyzer and uh, on-demand energy storage offered by the electrochemical capacitor and the lithium ion battery. And so after my PhD, I uh, joined an incubator called Entrepreneur First and uh, I was basically trying to commercialize what I had developed during my PhD. Uh, this is because uh, we were able to get insights into these systems that were unique and also offered uh, offered a tremendous potential to uh, make a good and solid improvements in, in the fields of uh, research and also industrial research um, with these technologies. And I picked the technology that was a bit more mature at that point in time. So uh, that is how I ended up focusing on lithium and batteries. Um, also alluding to my previous experience working with lithium and batteries during my bachelor's project, where I fabricated my own lithium and cells and conducted experiments on them. So that, that is the reason why I chose lithium and batteries again after my PhD. And uh, and tried to commercialize my algorithms through search analytics. And yeah, as a part of search analytics, we had um, several uh, in international customers, one from Canada, one from the US, of course, one from the UK, mm -hmm. uh, Antipower, that's how we met, and uh, a couple from Singapore and one from Hong Kong as well. Um, yeah, so the, the major offering initially, at least, was to accelerate the prototyping phase um, because the prototyping phase for a lithium ion uh, cell typically takes roughly between 12 to 18 months. So with the, uh, with the algorithms that I developed, they represented the reality uh, very well and you could test thousands of different combinations very quickly and narrowing down to just about top 10 or top five designs, which you can go and fabricate in the lab, um, cutting down, you know, dollars um, in terms of development costs, uh, time time to market, uh, because you don't uh, randomly have to check different combinations of materials and geometries based on just heuristics alone. Here you have evidence-based approach. So this was the, the key aspect. And then we were also broadening into um, performing quick QA, QC by employing a reduced order uh, model provided uh, through machine learning and AI to perform quick quality control checks in a production line once a cell comes out of the, comes out of the different stages of development, basically. So with measurements that uh, we typically do on the line, uh, during the production of a cell, if these are input into the into the model, it would spit out uh, within a fraction of a second what the performance of that cell is going to be. And with this, you can very easily identify the potential failures, the potential outliers. So this would save um, a lot of dollars in terms of warranty claims and also in terms of just the reputation of the company itself, uh, sending out quality cells at any given point in time. Brilliant, thanks, Vish. And, and you know, I think um, equally from what I understand, on top of what you said, you're also reducing the the necessary computational power um, that would would otherwise be vast. So what what you've done is you've devised and developed a system which is 
almost simplistic, but in a way that is extremely effective and also uses very much less computational power. So you can perform that on a on a standard laptop without needing Microsoft's um, uh, master computer to be able to do all the work for you. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah in essence, yes, but um, also, I mean, it was it was like you said, a reduction of the computational cost of the models uh, whilst retaining that accuracy, which is why we are able to represent the system. Uh, as close to reality as possible, and then push the system to its boundaries, and then get these thousands of different combinations toward its operating range. Yeah, yeah. So I know, I know you are um, working very, uh, very diligently with with your um, methodology with anti power, and I guess you're going to be using that as Williams too. But I mean. In terms of um, Alex's interest, I mean, do you do you see your models being also applicable to solid state um, battery situations? And, and I mean, of course, the the approach is agnostic um, to the chemistry. So once we develop the modeling framework for the sodium ion cell. Uh, sorry, uh, solid state cell, then it should definitely be possible. No, fantastic. I, I thought you'd say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alex, do you have any questions for Vish? I mean, that, that's quite an quite a amazing uh, uh, story, isn't it? No, it's, uh, yeah, incredible. And uh, again, again, really nice to meet you, Vish. And I and, uh, love hearing about this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, we. Uh, I think uh, it's take, modeling's taken some time for the industry to implement uh, at a wide scale, but it's you know, <laughs> uh, I think I think the sentiment's finally turning around. I th I think there was a, initially a lot of uh, resistance when it came, uh, when it came to modeling to, yeah, you know, there really are like certain parts of the cell that uh, you know, no amount of modeling will will be able to ever account for, right? Like, yeah. You know, the actual uh, maybe like engineering of you know parts like mm -hmm. um you know the tabs and and how they fit and how to put a process together for that but otherwise using modeling as a tool to you know scale down opex um and really streamline and accelerate uh time to market is is really exciting and proven and uh something we've been in, trying to implement more as well uh, we're still fairly early stage and, you know, it's still early days for us, but even we have developed out an internal a database just for traceability of, of all our materials and all our testing and trying to now use some, some AI tools. Um, I guess what I'm curious is, uh, yeah, your take on, you know, how, um, you, you know, how far can you really take it, right? Is it really possible to, um, yeah, maybe design some new, you know, develop some new active material, but all you know is just you know, the, you know, some assembly, yeah, you know, how the atoms, you know, are assembled, right? Can you really then take that through like density functional theory or like molecular yeah. fluid dynamics and then all the way to understanding how an automotive sized battery pack is, is going to behave with that? Um, is that really possible today or is that something we have to wait for in the future or what are your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, it is, I mean, I, I think the development uh, development is is going on exactly in this direction, um, all the way starting from the molecule or to, to an automotive application or a real world application, uh, basically. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, there are uh, a strong strides being made in the field of uh, DFT and molecular dynamic simulations as well. And especially with the advent of machine learning into that kind of a field, uh, <clears throat> the computational cost is being addressed because with molecular dynamic simulations and uh, DFT, the, the major hurdle, one other than the fact that it is all carried out in vacuum, the computational cost, a single model takes even days to weeks to run. And if that is addressed, then because 
one thing that is key for all of this is is the time scale at which you can do all of this because if you know the modeling approach takes a um a few months to give you something meaningful then it becomes a, a, a bit pointless because uh, you can carry out elementary experiments in that time period and get something solid out of it and that is much more reliable and it has a much better fidelity um, so that is why the computational cost or the computational efficiency is of key importance. And I think in um, and this should be happening pretty soon that uh, that such approaches will become possible. I would say they are in the works at the moment and should be available in the next couple of years or so easily, something that is that is even very, very reliable not just an experimental approach, but even a reliable uh, methodology. Well, that, thanks, Vish. And then um, my, my mind is screaming of, of an idea I had um, probably about maybe even up to 10 years ago, maybe five, 10 years ago. And that is, um, I, I, I conceive that wouldn't it be great if we could nano 3D print an electrode and what if you combine that approach with nano 3D printing of electrodes so you could absolutely 100% optimize the um, the geometry and, and performance of your electrodes? <laughs> absolutely, yeah. That sounds like the dream, basically. <laughs> well, I've seen a nano 3D printed version of the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it must be possible, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know enough about it. I think the key challenge with that is is the materials itself. Yeah. It's yeah. So nano print, uh, nano three D print the active materials that we actually require. Yeah. For the electrode. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where the challenge lies more than anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So so yeah. I mean, you know, you you've been around the um battery industry for quite a while and you've you've also a lot of experience like myself i guess with fuel cells and <clears throat> perhaps even supercapacitors <laughs> where where do you have any questions for alex surrounding um what they're doing with uh solid state and how that interfaces perhaps again with with what you're doing of course of course yeah um i mean because the, the major question that I have is we all know that you know solid state battery is is basically the holy grail when it comes to battery industry. Um, so uh, when do you think it would become a reality in terms of actual production? And how far along do you think that we are based on your first hand experience? Yeah, I think that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Ten, ten episodes in, and we get the million dollar question finally. Of course. <laughs> I mean, if if you can touch a bit on like where are the key challenges, I think that that will also be super helpful. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it, <laughs> there was a period of time when there'd be a a news article out about you know, something out of a national lab or university lab where this is some solid state battery that's going to change the whole industry and then mm -hmm. you know it would, uh, it's only recently i think that people you know, finally start asking well hey what whatever happened to the the thing that was supposed to revolutionize this whole sector <laughs> you know it's a uh, yeah, it's it's just it's it's unbelievably difficult to bring solid state from bench top to uh, I think one of the things is that like, you know, the the minimum criteria for success for solid state is is being, um, you know, as manufacturable as current lithium ion. The fact of the matter is, is that we've gotten like really good at producing lithium ion batteries. I mean, these mm -hmm. so many companies have spent so many billions of dollars and now you know, over thirty years perfecting these battery gigafactories that are continuous and high throughput and high yield low defect rate and um you get really high quality low cost lithium ion batteries and you know expecting the same thing 
out of solid state, you know, in the next five to 10 years is probably unfair, right? Um, or at least, you know, the uh, the most promising solid state. I mean, I think there are, there are going to have to be compromises and in, in degrees of success. So um, the most perfect solid state lithium metal battery with you know, the, the very highest energy, where we double energy density over lithium ion, where we have 15 minute charging, no problem, where we have thousands of cycles of cycle life. We're not going to have that kind of battery technology probably for at least at mass scale for at least 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. But maybe we could put something into high volume production today that will at least achieve the safety goals of solid state, where it will at least give you the energy density and maybe not the cycle life and maybe not the fast mm -hmm. charging. Um, and so, yeah, I think finally there's been some uh, change in the approach that R and D's, the approach to which we're taking the R and D in industry and in academia with solid state, where it's truly a manufacturing problem, um, and uh, it's exciting because it, you know we have these new tools like uh, computational tools and and modeling and um, especially to support manufacturing and 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 quality control. Um, that was interesting that you brought that up. You know, mm -hmm. one of the main challenges with solid state battery cells ultimately is just making mm -hmm. material that will be uniform across large areas, uh, fundamentally. Um, and that's, that's purely a quality control and process discipline challenge, um, that you have to aid with computational tools if you want to get it done. Right. So, um, I, I think I've been rambling a bit now, but <laughs> yeah. No, not, not at all. That's uh, useful, all, yeah. all interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead, Vish. Yeah. Um, so if I uh, can ask you just one more question on that, which step in the manufacturing process do you think has the most challenge today with uh, respect to the production of sodium, uh, sorry, solid state batteries? <clears throat> Yeah. Um, the most compelling solid state battery solutions are these ones, at least from a per performance perspective, are these technologies where you're using a, a ceramic material like you know, these oxide um, lithium garnet, you know, ceramics or sulfide based ceramics. Uh, you get, you know, you can get really great energy density and really great uh, charge discharge speeds and really mm -hmm. great uh, cycle life with these materials. But these are you know, ceramic materials and, and, and they're, they're brittle and inflexible. Um, and that is the opposite of you know what is needed for the continuous roll-to-roll -roll processes that are used in, in lithium ion today, right? Lithium ion depends upon materials. Lith current lithium ion battery production depends upon highly flexible, thin materials that can be processed roll to roll mm -hmm. and ceramics are not at all conducive to that and so you know you have to you really have to reconfigure the process to a great extent where you're cutting discrete squares of material out of ceramic and then stacking it with your battery electrodes and um, none of that is really continuous or high throughput yeah uh, <clears throat> And I, I, I liked, um, there was a piece, Porsche Consulting Magazine ran a good piece about this recently. Um, I think they found something like, if you try to take a ceramic-based solid-state technology um, and and you know, to bring it into a lithium-ion battery gigafactory and try to implement it, you would have to change at least 60% of the gigafactory floor to implement. And that's you know, all the equipment, how the factory floor is put together. And it's... Um, it would be a massive modification. Um, and so, you know, and so you could, you could try to do that. And there are plenty of companies now that they have a new process that they can make solid state batteries with, with their ceramic. And mm -hmm. they're going to try to bring that to gigafactory scale all on their own and then keep scaling it from there. Um, uh, you know, from my point of view, I don't, I don't know the extent to which that makes sense, given that we do already have all these gigafactories, um, already so many have been planned uh, and groundbroken, you know, to, to build them. And, um, and instead of, you know, people trying their hardest to make solid state compatible with these gigafactories, 
they want to build their own. Uh, so I don't I don't know yeah. how much that makes sense, but that's. <laughs> yeah, I think you're saying that, that, that there's a lot of sort of independent gigafactories going up, but what many um, of the even end users are choosing to do, especially the big players, is build their own. Yeah. Uh, rather like, well, I suppose Tesla going into um, partnership with Panasonic is mm -hmm. a kind of similar sort of thing. But yeah, we're 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 experiencing, or at least I'm hearing a lot about um, how, um, especially the big players are actually developing their own cell manufacture capabilities, and in a lot of ways, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. because they then have control over their supply chain and you know supply as far as i'm i'm mm -hmm. aware there's two things which um which are critical to cell manufacture and one as you've rightly uh, mentioned alex is uh, existing manufacturing infrastructure that is a key critical element of it but the other is supply chain you know, so for example, I, I I I use the story of Henry Ford, um, who was struggling to get the rubber for his tires, so he bought a country or something, and 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 put put a mini America into it, a mini American city into it, and started developing his own rubber, so that he could remove that supply chain uncertain uncertainty, and mm -hmm. um, yet said. So, yeah, that kind of um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, even today, uh, with with respect to even lithium and battery production, there there are supply chain issues that different parts of the world, including the Europe and the UK, uh, sorry, the EU and the UK. <laughs> yes. That yeah. there are significant uh, because of different trade laws and uh, the availability of the materials. And also, just the availability of the suppliers um, causes this pinch in supply chain that uh, you don't even have, uh, you know, alternative materials in case one supplier bails for a key component of a cell. And the, these are real issues that that are that are existing even today, and for uh, for something as established as a lithium ion battery industry. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things I first worked on um, many years ago was exactly looking at the UK uh, supply chain and trying to develop uh, the UK supply chain, and particularly in terms of active ingredients, so the mm -hmm. anode or cathode uh, materials. You know, but the 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 cell itself is so complex; it has about fifteen different um, key components. Yeah. components. Yeah, yeah. And so it's not just about where you get your anode and cathode material from. Where do you get your pouch material? Where do you get your electrolyte? Where do you get your um, tab material? And yeah. even even the most um, simple thing from an outside perspective, the tab is not simple in the slightest. It's extremely complicated. You know, down to the down to the minutest detail of of the. Um, the glue strip that is used to bond the pouch material over it, which is renowned for having difficulties with leakage, and and you know it it, it it's yeah it's uh, it's an interesting one and, and really <laughs> rather complex. What's the uh, supply chain um, situation like in the US? Because I'm, I'm you know I know in the UK it's um, challenged, but what's it like in the US, Alex? Yeah, well, um, as of you know, the past few weeks, uh, people are, I think people feel like they're running around with their hair on fire a little bit because of, uh, you know, People's Republic of China, they you know, are threatening these export bans on graphite. And, uh, you know, graphite is the material of choice for virtually every lithium ion battery anode right now. And mm -hmm. almost all of it is either produced or refined in China. And yeah. Um and so, you know, in the US it's it's going through a process of decoupling from Chinese manufacturing that's been long and going to get longer. And uh, you know, so to one extent it's you know, 
there's now a huge demand for domestic you know, synthetic graphite production and um there uh, there aren't a lot of companies you can really turn to domestically that do that right now uh, mm-hmm. it'll have to be a whole new base that you know people want to build up basically overnight now uh, the other alternative is that you go with a next generation battery chemistry that's not reliant on graphite. So maybe one that uses silicon anode or um, yeah. lithium metal anode. And, yeah. and, you know, the good thing is these have perf- performance benefits. You know, the, the bad thing is these are still pretty mature technologies that we're going to have to advance, you know, advance rapidly and, and figure out how to make them low cost, or at least as cheap cost parity with you know graphite based cells mm-hmm. so it's uh yeah it's and and you think about and that's not even talking about the cathode side right and, and all the challenges there with um you know manganese and cobalt and other transition metals that you might use and again most of which are refined in china right now and otherwise sourced from uh you know perhaps yeah, not the most ethical means in in countries where, yeah, you know, there's there's some chaos uh, being caused by you know, the extraction of these materials. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so it's a, it's a lot. At least for us, you know, at Nature, we we just focus on the electrolyte active material. So thankfully, we don't have to worry about graphite. Really, that's other people's problems. Or transition metals, that's other people's problems for the most part as well. Um, but just lithium, right? It, where do you get lithium itself from? Well, again, most of it is refined in China right now. I think the U.S. has done a good job in trying to develop a domestic lithium supply chain, but it'll mm-hmm. take a lot more time to mature. Um, and the rate at which people want to deploy electric vehicles and build out all this electrified infrastructure dependent on lithium batteries, this supply is not going to be able to catch uh, keep up. I think it's as simple as that, but... Um, We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I think um, from my perspective, I mean, I know most recently um, in the UK, they've announced um, a, an initiative uh, through the company Cornish Lithium. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they, they've, I mean, I don't know too much about it. I've, I've read bits and pieces, but I think they've found a source in Cornwall, which is um, which is interesting. Um, but for me, it goes back to one of the reasons I got so excited when I first met you, Alex, and that was your um, your your direction towards sodium. Because I mean, I think I I completely get and understand the the drive for lithium at the moment, but I really do think that um, in order to address a lot of the issues that you've just expounded, um, mm-hmm. sodium for me makes makes a tremendous amount of sense. And I think that um, that uh, I can see sodium becoming more, I mean, it, it is at the moment becoming more and more uh, prominent in the news and in the, in, in the discussions. And I can see it becoming a more important um, uh, cell material uh, in, in, in the future. For me, hopefully in the near future, but you know, I, I don't know how it will pan out. Yeah, I mean, sodium is what three times, three thousand times more abundant than lithium in the Earth's crust. Uh, something like thirty times cheaper. Um, and uh, yeah, we've you know we've been developing active, you know, electrolyte active materials for sodium batteries. Uh, the trick thing is, is you know, supply. If if lithium, yeah, we have we have enough of a challenge with lithium supply chains, but then. <laughs> You know, sodium supply chains definitely are, are going to require some more maturing, and then yeah, um, yeah, the the other parts of the sodium battery cell need some more work, such as the sodium cathode and, and the sodium anode. Um, and so, so I think we've been waiting for those to catch up, and and they will. And sodium is definitely one of those technologies that um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to make a transition to in a, a ten year time frame or so. Um, that's going to be much more sustainable, much more economical uh, and resource efficient. Um, I'm actually, so I'm curious to get Vicious take on this is from what I understand, um, computational tools, especially machine learning ones, they they depend upon having 
a good amount of baseline, you know, data to go off of, right? You know, so if you can study that data, then you can take and, and learn and extrapolate things about new data you collect, right? Um, and one of the tricky things I think with sodium development is like uh, there isn't there hasn't been a much as much of it as there has been with with lithium batteries, right? So whereas with lithium, there's so much data you can draw from sodium, not so much, uh, right? And and sodium, it is a different system. Um, mm -hmm. There, you know, even thinking about like you know, there are fundamental changes you need to even make at electric vehicle battery pack level when you put together sodium battery cells because sodium battery cells operate in completely different voltage ranges than lithium and have different voltage steps, right? Um, so how, uh, and when you're talking about a, uh, an alternative chemistry like that, um, how, you know, how difficult is it to develop effective computational tools or can you keep using, can you apply lithium, ones that were developed for lithium batteries, for example? Good question. Yeah, no, not, not directly. Yeah, and uh, the approach that that you have been mentioning uh, about the computational tools requiring a huge amount of data, that is that is very true for machine learning or pure machine learning and AI based approaches. Yes, because in essence, if you look at what a machine learning algorithm or an AI tool does, is it's a glorified um, sort of pattern fitting algorithm. So. If you don't teach it how to fit that pattern properly, then it's going to fit whatever it wants. And this is one of the, the key challenges when, when the, the computation models that rely purely on machine learning and AI are developed for such complex uh, physical systems. Because there are so many different physical phenomena that happen within the cell and simply they, they cannot be, the complexity cannot be captured just by by doing this without an underlying layer that teaches the model how to fit the data. And, um, and it's very easy to fit these uh, outliers and come up with false positives that may not be of much issue right now, but uh, in, in practical applications, when these are employed, these outliers are the ones that lead to catastrophic incidents. And that's when it becomes very important. And we simply don't have the numbers now that it becomes a major issue yet but so i mean it just com uh, compare the number of uh, petrol based cars or diesel based cars and number of evs on road so obviously you don't have those numbers yet and that is why it is not uh, becoming a or it is not as evident as it should be uh, but, but yeah but with respect to that that is also one of the reasons why we always start with a physics based approach where we try to understand the underlying physical phenomena and model them, model with that complexity, and then use that as the truth, and then develop the machine learning or AI-based algorithms so that uh, the, the machine learned model or the AI-based model is also physically consistent wherever it is being applied. And, um, and yeah, so the modeling approaches are also catching up. And I know uh, there have been a few papers that have been published uh, recently in the last two, three years even, um, that uh, about physics-based modeling on of sodium ion batteries. And, uh, and yeah, so this is definitely a field that has uh, much room for improvement. And, uh, and obviously, research will definitely catch up. And they, they've already published like the underlying principles of how to come up with a physics-based model for a sodium and battery already. So it is about, you know, perfecting that model, uh, making it more computationally efficient. And also where can it be reduced? Uh, the complexity can be reduced. And, uh, and all the good things that we have for lithium and coming up. Um, so they, they can translate to sodium and, but they cannot be directly just applied, but uh, there needs to be an element of translation that needs to go in. No, thanks, Vishen. Uh, just, just touching on a little bit of what you said then, I think you were alluding to the fact that um, when you're developing the models and through the process, you actually do rely on quite a bit of field data 
which you were saying just isn't available at the moment. And and yeah, I mean, I've I've a lot of experience in that, um, particularly surrounding warranty companies mm-hmm. who are it's a chicken and egg situation because without the field data, they're not able to have the information that they can then mm-hmm. build upon in order to provide the warranties. And it seems like a similar sort of situation with the uh, with the development that you're describing. Yeah, in a way, yes. Uh, say, for example, that the first uh, physics-based model for lithium-ion batteries was established in, in, in the 1990s or so. Uh, late 1990s or so uh, by uh, Doyle, uh, Phil and Newman. And so the, this Newman model is the one that is still being used, uh, modifications of that. And so similarly, um, the first sodium ion battery physics-based model was uh, developed or has been published in the last three years or so. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so for the advantage of the physics based model is that it requires a lot of complicated inputs into the model because it is a very complex model in in but um, in itself so but f- for you to calibrate and validate the model you don't need tons and tons of data that is the advantage right, of this approach right, right, right. and so once you have a properly working model that represents the reality uh, to to an extent that gives you the confidence, then you can use that and then change the different parameters that are sensible to change. Again, yeah. uh, you can't have, uh, you can't be uh, changing, you know, parameters like having the the uh, cathode much uh, bigger than the anode. Obviously, we need, we know that uh, there should be an excess in the anode, not the cathode. So yeah. if, we, if we do such. <clears throat> sorry, uh, logical sort of uh, parameter changes and uh, and then let the model predict the results, then that will definitely give us the direction as to which way we need to take. And then and then the, the physical uh, experiments can follow that particular direction and, and the accelerated development uh, happens eventually. No, thanks, Vision. And here's here's your million dollar question: Do you do you envision a situation in the future whereby a client comes to a battery manufacturer and says, "I want these parameters," and the battery manufacturer simply punches them into the computer, and it spits out the uh, the cell? Uh, eventually, um, it is possible, I would say, and especially with the advancements in in the field of computer science. So that's what, uh, when the first lithium-ion battery came out, uh, the, the model, uh, look at the the advancement in the field of computer science back then in the late 1990s, and then yeah. uh, look at where the advancement in computer science now is. Yeah. So obviously, um, a lot of these computations can be crunched at a much faster rate. And eventually, I think that it is possible, but then as we always say, uh, it should be taken with a pinch of salt, <laughs> the results that they get, and um, and there's got to be a bit of a human element, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. There, there needs to be uh, this human element, um, and also there needs to be spot checks as to how close it is to reality and how representative it is of reality as well, because. Yeah. If we lose the element of reality in what we are doing, then uh, then it is moot. Basically, it's a moot point of uh, what what we are doing becomes a moot point. Basically, yeah, and uh, and yeah. So the the model's output can uh, should definitely be physically validated as well. Yeah, that element of validation still needs to be there. And yeah. and yeah, because it's a machine. End of the day, so uh, there needs to be a human element. Yeah, will uh, th- that that will be good to know. That's yeah. actually quite encouraging. <laughs> yeah. We won't be uh, wiped out by machines just yet. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. yeah. So brilliant. That that's that's been fantastic. We've we've come we've come to the end of our 
our quota now. Um, Alex, do you have any final questions or words for, for Vish? Not at the moment, but uh, no, I'd, I'd love to stay in touch, Vish. And uh, it was very nice meeting you. And yeah, I learned so much about uh, uh, what you do and, and, you know, this whole part of the industry that's that's going to grow and evolve. So um, thank you very much for the time today. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, likewise, and uh, I'll keep an eye out for the exciting things that uh, you guys are up to, and I will closely follow you. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, I'll, I'll put you guys in touch, and um, to, just to end, mm -hmm. and to the audience, thank you so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here with Vish and Alex, as, as usual, and um, thanks very much. Feel free to stay on a bit later, guys, if you want, and we can... I'm going to stop the recording now.